Greetings from Fort Marnock. My name is Phil Mark Quigley, and I'm chairperson of Fort Marnock Community Association and also a member of our Southern Cross Festival Committee. In June each year, we stage a Southern Cross Festival to celebrate the Southern Cross aircraft, taking off in 1930 from a beautiful beach here in Fort Marnock to fly across the Atlantic. Only the second East West crossing of the Atlantic. We aren't having a festival this year on the 90th anniversary of takeoff, unfortunately, but rather than give up on doing something, we decided that we'll put together this video to tell you more about the Southern Cross. The transatlantic flight from Port Marnock was one leg of a longer journey by the Southern Cross and its Australian pilot, Charles Kingsford Smith. As it was the first plane to achieve an aerial circumnavigation of the world, traversing both hemispheres. The adventure started on 31st of May 1928, when Charles Kingsford Smith and his crew for the leg, co-pilot Charles Ohm, navigator Harry Lyons, radio operator James Warner, took off from Oakland, California, heading to Brisbane in Australia for the first successful Trans-Pacific flight. The Southern Cross stopped for rest and refueling in Hawaii after over 27 hours flight. And the next leg then took them from Hawaii to Fiji, over 34 and a half hours of flying, arriving in Suva, the capital of Fiji, where a large and enthusiastic crowd saw the first aircraft to land in Fiji Thursday. From Fiji, the Southern Cross set off on the final leg to Eagle Farm Airport in Brisbane, arriving on the 9th of June, where a crowd of 25,000 people were waiting to greet the Southern Cross on its arrival. Brisbane Airport produced this video in 2018 to celebrate the 19th anniversary of the flight. Australia have such an affection for this man, I think, I think he epitomizes Australia. And, and uh, so I'm trying to pick up on that and trying to find out the, the components of why he was so loved, if that's the right word. The Southern Cross flew to Sydney from Brisbane on the 10th of June 1928. But it was another year before it started off the next leg of the circumnavigation. Leaving Sydney and arriving at Derby in Western Australia on the 26th of June 1929. From Derby, the plane and its crew continued west, stopping after each day's flight at new location for the night. They flew first to Singapore and then on to Songla in Thailand, at the time known as Singora. From there, it was on to Yangon in Myanmar, previously known as Rangoon in Burma. It was then on to Calcutta, now known as Calcutta, on to Allahabad across India, now known as Prayagraj, and then over to Karachi in Pakistan. From there, it was on to Iran and visiting. Bandar Abbas and stopping there, onto Basra in Iraq and continuing on to Baghdad. From Baghdad, they made their first stop in Europe, stopping off in Athens, and from there, they flew to Rome. The final flight of this leg of the journey was from Rome to, to Croydon Airport in London on the 10th of July, 1929. Having arrived in Croydon, the plane was then brought to the Fokker factory in Amsterdam to be overhauled and it would be nearly a year before Charles Kingsford Smith continued with his record-breaking navigation of the globe. In June 1930, the plane arrived at Baldonnen Airport near Dublin and from there it flew on the 23rd of June to Port Marnock Beach where it was prepared for the flight across the Atlantic. 
The next few videos will tell you more about the flight or festival, and we also have some music for you, which we hope you enjoy. This year, our festival had to be cancelled, a world-shattering event in the form of the pandemic caused by COVID-19 has temporarily halted life as we know it. But thanks to modern technology and me media expertise, this fa festival has become virtual. The festival has involved many talented individuals and hopefully we will reach out to many people and maybe many others who follow and celebrate epic undertaking undertakings such as the flight of the Southern Cross. We are all set to take flight again next year, albeit a year late for the 90th anniversary. Our celebrations will continue in the village of Port Marnock and we'll be working towards and looking forwards to 2030 so we can celebrate the centenary of this historic flight from our beautiful beach. Bruce Goldsmith had been a fighter pilot in World War I and was awarded the Military Cross. Back in Australia, he got involved in commercial aviation and with Charles Ollam, they founded Australian National Airways. He made numerous record-breaking flights, most spectacularly that from Oakland to Brisbane in 1928. Within a year, he had another spectacular in his sights, east-west across the Atlantic, on to Oakland, thus completing the circumnavigation. For this, he chose a Dutchman as his co-pilot, Evert van Dijk, a career pilot with, the, with KLM. While considered somewhat aloof and reserved, van Dijk had gained a reputation as a pilot of exceptional all-weather flying ability. The engineer and radio operator was New Zealander, John Stanage, an experienced radio officer he had refused a place on Kingsford Smith's Trans-Pacific flight, regarding it as a suicide mission. Captain Paddy Saul, the navigator, had sailed the world in wind jammers, rising to master mariner. Serving with the Royal Engineers in the Gulf area during World War I, he came back to Ireland, but in 1922, master of a ship, he lost his wife in a shipwreck, but managed to save their infant daughter, Patricia. Turning to aerial navigation, he became a leading member of the Irish Aero Club. This led to his recruitment in 1930 by Kingsford Smith for the transatlantic flight. On his return to Dublin that summer, speeches at a state banquet in his honour were relayed live on Irish national radio. While with the RAF in England during World War II, he was recruited to head the new Irish Air Traffic Control Service. He led that service until his retirement in 1968, attending international aviation conferences in Europe and North America. What's that? So he was an extraordinary man and he's but there's one there of the crew with that's yeah. that's Pat, his daughter in the middle. You may oh, be. Oh, that's to terrific! Do. I haven't seen that. Yeah. And that's that's the full crew. Yeah. Uh, I, I have lots of photographs there of um, the crew and uh, my aunt Santoy, who's in this photograph here. In fact, I think. When you had your uh, celebration last year at the Port Marnock Hotel, she was on one of the photographs and she actually got to fly in the Southern Cross. Uh, they flew out over Port Marnock when they were working out if it would be a good place or not for the takeoff for their Atlantic flight. So she got to actually have a flight in the aircraft, which is, is quite extraordinary. And, and I knew her well, and indeed, I know her daughter who lives not 
not far from here. Uh, so yes, Uncle Paddy was, as um, Gary said, he, he rounded Cape Horn two or three times by the age of 23 or 24 in square riggers, which is an extraordinary feat in itself. But then what he went on to do in, in future years, partly led by circumstances of World War I and World War II, uh, is exceptional. To get on an airplane in Port Monic Strand with three other chaps and head off into the unknown must take some enormous courage. Uh, lucky I, I, I knew Uncle Paddy for the first 10 years of my life. It, indeed, he died 52 years ago, two days ago. On, on Monday was the 52nd anniversary of his death. In later life, he also did quite exceptional things. He was president of the Irish Sea Angling Association, was instrumental uh, in developing that in Ireland. And indeed, he died a very happy death, having caught a record fish in Loch Swilly. Uh, and was brought ashore to the Pier Hotel in Rathmullen, which in later years I holidayed in many, many times in, in that particular area. And indeed they had a little plaque up in the Pier Hotel celebrating his life and, and his death on that date. Uh, the, I suppose the exceptional piece that I have is the, the medal that was presented. Four medals were cast and presented to each of the four crew on the steps of the City Hall in New York. Uh, the inscription reads, presented by Honorable James J. Walker, Mayor of the City of New York, June the 27th, 1930, commemorating the transatlantic flight of the Southern Cross. And indeed, with, with all the press cuttings I have, they were treated like superstars, I suppose, at the time, and given ticker tape welcomes through the streets of New York, which, it's unheard of even in these days. So it, it was quite a life that he had, I must say, and uh, a privilege for me to be a, a tiny, tiny part of that family. ...to keep awake. Harbour Grace was not the target. Stanage's radio buildings and Saul's master compass eventually established their position 50 miles from Harbour Grace. The cloud ceiling ahead was lifting. Things were looking good. In a release of nervous tension, Saul roared out at the top of his lungs a current hit, singing in the rain, but with the engine noise, he could not even hear himself. About then, from his seagoing days, Saul recognised a distinctive Bull Point Lighthouse below. Soon Kingsford Smith circled twice above the airfield at Harbour Grace, where a smoky fire indicated wind direction. He landed safely, following a flight of over 30 hours. For the crew, hot baths, warm hospitality and a good night's rest followed. That's it.
Roger on Baby, no, sir, don't mean maybe, yes, sir, that's my baby now, right now, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, when we reach the preacher, I'm saying, put it up one toe. My baby, no, no, sir. I don't mean maybe, yes, sir. That's my baby now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't mean maybe. That's my baby My name is Mick Kelly. I run a hedge school which is a relaxed place where people come to share stories about um, aviation and history. As part of um, the Southern Cross annual celebration in Port Marnock. Um, it's run in conjunction with Gary Ahern, the local historian. From listening to people talking about the Southern Cross flight. It became clear to me that they really wanted to connect head and heart with the airplane taken off from the Velvet Strand in Port Marnock. So I wrote a few lines of a poem and uh, my background is as a mechanic so I took the liberty of given the, the airplane some human qualities so that it can communicate better with us ab about its takeoff run. The poem is called Southern Cross Emotional Departure. My parts are from the earth, my assemblers from there too, from deep below its surface and scattered across its globe. My parents are from Holland, my children's spirit too. I'm here on Velvet Strand in Port Marnock's month of June. Inside me there is churning a job so big to do. They'll do it as professionals. They are my glorious crew. We'll cross the wild Atlantic with all its moods and risks. I'll get them safe to Auckland, have circled like a disc. It's two years since Charles and I left Auckland far behind. On Velvet Strand, relax, mind. This beach is long and golden in the early morning light. My engines are just humming, ready for the flight. Southwards we are rolling along the velvet strand. Elevators gently moving by Charles commanding hand. My wings are lifting now into the atmosphere. At this weight I can't do it without touching here. But now we are flying just above the sand. 10,000 people waving. Oh, Port Marnock, it was grand. The story of aviation in Harbour Grace first begins in 1919, the year of the Great Atlantic Air Race. 
The Hanley Page Atlantic, a competitor, was sent to Harbor Grace by rail in 105 crates. Mark Kerr, pilot, and crew assembled the plane on several farmer's fields where a bumpy 900 by 100 yard aerodrome was constructed. In the words of Joseph R. Smallwood, Newfoundland Labrador's first premier and father of Confederation, then working as a journalist covering the event, it wasn't one field, but a series of gardens and farms with rock walls between them. These all had to be considerable obstructions, a barracks, which had to be destroyed. Gangs of men carried out this work, and then, when all was cleared, a heavy roller, drowned by three horses and weighed down with several hundred pounds of iron bars, eliminated the hummocks. The result, after a month, was a bumpy aerodrome. The field became known as Hanley Page by the Sea. Today, the land roughly corresponds to the St. Francis soccer pitch in Harbor Grace. The town's first official airstrip came eight years later, in 1927, when Fred Kohler visited Newfoundland to find a suitable area for landing Waco Oil's plane, the Pride of Detroit. On a train out from St. John's, Kohler met John L. Oak, a Harbor Grace native, who recommended the area of the present day strip. In the exciting early days of aviation, the airship proposal was warmly received by residents. They relished the chance to bring Harbor Grace into the 20th century by way of this technological innovation. At a public meeting at the town hall on July 25th, a 21 person committee was formed, the Harbor Grace Airport Trust Company. Work began in earnest on August 8th, 1927. With money and equipment from private investors and the Newfoundland government, local laborers clear cut an area measuring 4,000 feet in length by 300 feet in width. The work took 18 days, finishing on August 26th, just in time for the arrival of the Pride of Detroit, pilot William S. Brock and Edward Schley, president of Waco Oil. In its history, the airship hosted 20 transatlantic flights, some successful, some unsuccessful. None were more famous than Amelia Earhart's solo flight across the Atlantic. Leaving Harbor Grace on May 20th, 1932, Earhart landed in Colmore, Northern Ireland to international acclaim, becoming the first woman to accomplish this feat alone. Another was the flight of Errol Boyd and Harry Connor, the first two Canadians to successfully cross the Atlantic by plane. Today, the airstrip remains a prized community asset in the town of Harbor Grace. The airstrip is still active, with amateur aviation club Copa Flight 97 maintaining the land for the recreational use. And visitors come from all over to see Lou Boykov's statue of Amelia Earhart in Riverhead, near the site of the SS Kyle. Charles Kingsford Smith, pilot. Captain Everett Van Dyke, co-pilot. Captain J.D. Saul, weather and smooth flying to Roosevelt Field, New York their anticipated destination for their east-west transatlantic flight. Heading for Cape Race, Newfoundland, on the Avalon Peninsula's southern extremity, the quartet anticipated turning southwest, flying down the coast of Maine, and landing at New York sometime around 11 a.m. Newfoundland time on Wednesday, June 25th. The team sent hourly radio messages, updating operators and the public of their journey. At 2.45 a.m., the first message reported them leaving the Irish coast. At 5 o'clock p.m. Newfoundland time, Kingsford Smith noted their traveling speed, 80 miles per hour, and complained about the weather. Everything going fine. Wish we could get out of this beastly fog. We feel closed in so much. However, the fog didn't abate, and a change of direction was in store for the Southern Cross, a stop in Harbor Grace, Newfoundland, whose airfield, constructed in 1927 for the landing of Waco Oil's Pride of Detroit, would soon launch this rural center into aviation lore. The Harbor Grace Airport was operated by the Harbor Grace Airport Trust Company, an incorporated body of local citizens, and hosted 20 transatlantic flights in a nine-year period. With their compass out of order and gas supply dwindled, Kingsford Smith and crew notified Harbor Grace they'd be landing at the Strip in the early hours of Wednesday, June 25th. At 8.25 a.m. Newfoundland time, the Southern Cross touched down safely on the coastal dirt strip, a perfect landing after 32 hours in the air. News spread quickly of their safe arrival, another successful transatlantic flight for the history books. The crew reported excellent weather until nearing Cape Race, that blasted fog, and were in good spirits, despite being deafened by the plane's roaring engines. The crew thanked their lucky stars for sound radio advice from the stations at Cape Race and Belle Isle, and the coastal steamers which kept them notified of their position.
The crew spent the night at Harbor Grace, lodging at the Cochrane House, the site of many overnighters and warm meals for transatlantic aviators, to enjoy their triumph and rest from the tribulations. At daybreak on Thursday, June 26th, Kingsford Smith and crew ate breakfast at the Cochrane House and headed to the Strip with four vacuum bottles of coffee, boiled eggs, and sandwiches for the trip. Their next destination? Where they first intended to land, Roosevelt Field, New York. After tax taxiing 150 yards of the Strip, the crew left Harbor Grace, heading in a northwesterly direction. After a safe landing in New York, the crew received the tra traditional hero's welcome. A joyous crowd greets from City Hall and guests of honor in President Hoover's White House. On the 26th of June, the Southern Cross left Harbor Grace and flew to Roosevelt Field in New York, where they were welcomed as heroes. With a ticket tape parade down Broadway, watched by huge crowds. We can see modern Broadway in the short clip from New York. After completing his record breaking transatlantic flight from Port Marnock, where I was raised, to Newfoundland and then on to New York, Charles Kingsford Smith was given the honor of a ticket tape parade right here down the Canyon of Heroes in Broadway in Lower Manhattan. Kingsford Smith and his crew left the plane in New York to be serviced and were flown to Washington, where they were taken to the White House to have lunch with President Herbert Hoover. On return from Washington, they picked up the Southern Cross and the 1st of July flew from there to Chicago. Two days later, they flew on to Salt Lake City and then on to Oakland, where they returned to complete their triumphant navigation of the world. We have a new zeal of their landing in California on the 4th of July to show you before Alvis Crawford closes out our video today. advantage of this opportunity to say hello to you and also to, uh, in public, congratulate the boys on putting up a marvelous show. Cheerio, Ben. <laughs> Fine show. Cheerio, <laughs> Pat. Uh, cheerio, Johnny. Oh, yeah. How do you like to look at the boys?